Hello, my name is John DeMay. I'm with uh, Barefoot Networks. Um, I'm located out of Silicon Valley. Our office is about um, two kilometers from Netsia's office, so right in the heart of things. So uh, what I plan to talk to uh, today is the uh, transformation of building networks uh, through software. So everybody should recognize this. SDN is, was mentioned in the previous talks uh, over three dozen times. Uh, SDN has been around for about 10 years. Uh, and it's, um, it's kind of a given, uh, we take it for granted, that if you own a big uh, network, you control that network. Um, you control that network with uh, software that either you develop yourself, uh, you buy from somebody, you commission, or you could even download from GitHub. With the uh, open source projects that are now available, this is getting even easier. So now you have, for your uh, brains, you have Onos, you have ODL, Ryu, Cord, NSX, ONAP, and many others. The challenge, however, though, is um, the software-defined piece uh, is used to program the control plane. But what innovation has been happening in the data plane or in the forwarding plane in the past 10 years? Uh, I would submit to you that uh, there's very little innovation that's happened over the past 10 years that makes the networks either easier to use, uh, easier to manage, more efficient, or easier to monitor. And that's what's been lacking here. So there's been a stagnation uh, with the forwarding plane. So that said, what if you wanted to add a new proprietary protocol to your network or remove protocols that you don't need? Oftentimes we see there's de uh, devices that are available for merchant markets. Silicon have uh, protocols that are unneeded and, and unused and untested for. Um, what if you want to add private headers to your packets so you can carry uh, information throughout the network? Maybe it's for measurement, maybe it's for other things. Um, remove um, middle boxes and move that functionality into the forwarding plane. Or most importantly, what if you have some new, innovative, beautiful idea that you would like to implement in the forwarding plane? Well, and, and that way you're able to differentiate from your competitors. Well, as it is, as things stand today, it's not possible. So here I have a, a simple cartoon of, of a switch or router as uh, uh, it exists today. You'll have some sort of protocol. You'll have a switch OS that's written by some uh, supplier like a Juniper with uh, Junos or uh, NXOS from Cisco, et cetera. And then you'll have a driver that talks to the ASIC. But what happens if you want to add a new proprietary protocol? So for illustrative purposes, let's imagine we're back in 2008 again, and you wanted to add in VXLAN. Well, the first thing that has to happen is that the uh, uh, networking uh, platform provider needs to write the uh, software in their switch OS. They need to change the driver, and then they need to add that um, functionality into the silicon itself. And that silicon could take two years before it gets uh, uh, to market. And the process for that kind of looks like this. You'll have a network owner. They'll tell the network equipment vendor, hey, I need to have this new feature, this new protocol added. That equipment vendor will then have their software team go off and develop some software, uh, largely to, to determine whether or not it's feasible. And that's usually a matter of weeks for that to happen. And then an RFC will be written, and then the uh, network equipment vendor or a merchant market silicon provider will decide, does it make sense to go off and spend millions of dollars to actually develop that ASIC? And if, it, and if the answer is yes, then it takes years for that ASIC to be uh, um, developed, and it takes years for that to get to production. So when you need a new feature, you can't just upgrade the software. Um, new forwarding, Functionality takes years to develop. And then when you finally upgrade your silicon, uh, either it no longer solves your problem because you came up with some sort of software workaround to, to uh, overcome the limitations, or you need to build a new product. So that brings me to the, uh, the part of my discussion where I talk about why is programmability happening now. So in the history of, of 
domain-specific processors. Um, computers have used CPUs uh, for graphics. We have GPUs, uh, DSPs for signal processing. Now we have uh, TCPs for um, machine learning. Um, but the question was, why was there never a domain-specific uh, device for networking? And largely the, the, the uh, reason for that is that networking hadn't caught up to uh, computers yet when it comes to uh, processing. The other reason is that uh, nobody took the time to step back and invest in building a domain-specific processor. And that's what we've done, is built uh, an architecture we call PISA, or programmable, or excuse me, protocol independent switch architecture. And so what you can think of is PISA is to networking as risk is to compute. That's a good analogy to think. So how does this work? Oh, one other thing I wanna mention is that, you know, for the past 10 years or so, um, Conventional wisdom is that programmability adds cost, it adds power, and it also um, adds to your, uh, uh, the die size of, the, of a device. And so we've actually proven that that is no longer the case. Uh, we have been shipping our Tofino device for about uh, a year and a half now. So what does PISA look like? What is that uh, programmability? How does that get implemented? Well. Here's a cartoon to kind of illustrate uh, how that works. You'll notice that there's a parser, there's some uh, replicated match action stages, and you'll notice uh, there's many of them and they're uniform, and the reason for that is it makes the uh, silicon architecture easier, it makes the compiler development easier, it, and it makes uh, uh, writing uh, uh, programs for it easier as well. So what happens is when a, a packet comes into the device, you'll have, um, the parser will remove the, the header of the packet from the body. And then the next step is it'll be compared in this match action unit. So there's memory blocks inside here that will look at the, uh, the header information. And if there's a match, it'll take an action. And all of this is defined and described by your P4 program. And then that uh, header information is carried on through the pipeline, additional, uh, Changes can be made to that, uh, that metadata as it's going down the pipeline. And then at the end, you have a block we call a deparser, and that's where the body of the uh, packet is recombined with this header information. So here's kind of some examples of what P4 looks like. I'm not gonna go through these uh, examples in detail, but it's very C-like in structure. It's very uh, uh, easy to learn. And um, we provide, and I'll talk about this in a minute, a, uh, a complete pipeline definition we call switch.p4, which is under 5,000 lines of code. So imagine 5,000 lines of code to define everything you would need to do in a, a switch or a router, uh, whether it's L2, L3, um, any sort of quality of service, tunneling, overlays, et cetera. All of that can be done with under 5,000 lines of P4 code. Now, New features can be implemented in a network in a matter of hours instead of years. So this is the big advantage that you get. The other advantage is that you can reuse the hardware. Rather than rip and replace, you can reuse the hardware by simply just reprogramming it. So if you want to add a new function like a virtual BNG, all you need to do is reprogram that, that, uh, that switch. So um, I just want to point out uh, the P4 community is growing. Um, P4.org is now part of ONF. That expands the number of contributors, developers, uh, the number of targets for P4. Uh, before we, uh, P4 merged with uh, ON ONF, uh, it was a little bit smaller, but uh, n nonetheless growing. Now we have the, uh, the full power and backing of, uh, of ONF. And there are uh, a number of working groups. Um, I won't go through all these, but just want to point out that P4 is defined and is the features that are added are defined by members of P4. And it's an Apache license, it's free to join. So I talked about you know, why programmability is happening now. Now the question is, how is it being used? So I'll go through a few, uh, a few cases here. So the first and foremost is reducing complexity. As I mentioned before, um, we provide this switch.p4 program. 
So if you look at this, you have a, a P4 program, you have a compiler. When you compile, that's what uh, defines how that switch will operate. So we provide this, it's open source, free of charge. You can go on the GitHub and look at the source code. And how it becomes simple to use is that you just delete out the functionality that you, that you don't want to use. Now, the beautiful thing with that is it allows you to scale for the functionality that you do want to use. So if you need large tables for ACLs or large tables for NATs, now you can use those, you can build those because you've deleted the things you don't need. So that's one, one way that uh, uh, programmability is being used. So now you have your, your version of the switch.p4, you compile, and now the silicon just only supports those protocols, those features that you uh, left uh, in the, the switch.p4 program. What does that result in? You get lower latency, lower power. So the fewer stages you use, the fewer resources you use on the chip, you can get lower latency and lower power. This is another advantage of programmability in that you can fine tune not only the power but the latency of, of the uh, switch that it would have in your network. All right, some other uh, use cases where programmability is being used is uh, adding custom features. So here's an example where uh, perhaps you want to add new encapsulations or you want to continue to parse inner headers or aggregate, uh, sorry, ag aggregate and segment different types of traffic. Uh, so that's one thing that you can do. Another thing you can do is offload uh, sync or heartbeat messages very, very quickly. Uh, you can decrease detection time for failures, and then also uh, decrease uh, convergence times and increase accuracy. So these are some of the custom features that can be done with, with P4. So I already kind of mentioned some of these, so uh, I'll keep going here. So now let's talk about some real world applications. How are people deploying uh, programmable functions into their networks. The first one I'd like to show is a uh, layer four load balancer. So today, if you have a purpose-built hardware, you'll have traffic coming in, it'll go to your load balancer, your hardware, maybe it's F5, A10, something like that. And then it'll go off to your, to your rack. Um, we also see um, software load balancers being used, same sort of idea. Uh, now, instead of having that purpose-built hardware, you'll use uh, x86 machines, but effectively have the same sort of problem where you have uh, some dedicated equipment being used to do that. Now, with P4, you just simply program that functionality into your switch or your router. So now there's no need to have those, those servers or those um, purpose-built uh, load balancers, and you can simply do your load balancing with the switch. What are some of the uh, benefits? Well, you can reduce cost and power. We've seen uh, one customer remove 200 servers with one of these Tofino switches, so there's real cost benefits here. Um, you can increase the bandwidth. Instead of operating at uh, you know, tens of gigabits per second, you're operating at uh, multiple terabit speeds. Um, a significant reduction in latency, up to 1,000 times, and up to 10 million HTTP flows. And there's a publication that uh, has been written, a white paper, so you can actually see uh, uh, some reference material for this. Another example, I'll go through this one quickly, it's very similar, would be a firewall. Again, you have some sort of purpose-built hardware, but now instead of using that uh, purpose-built hardware, simply write a P4 program, and you can run that, that functionality on top of your switch or router. The nice thing is that you get a new firewall entry on demand, and you keep an audit record for every single entry. Sorry. So what are the benefits? Well, now you can get over a million firewall entries per second. You can create an audit uh, record for every new uh, flow and firewall entry. And now that it's in line, you're having this, uh, this functionality occur at 6.5 terabits per second and under a microsecond. So very, very fast. Key value store is another interesting use case we've seen deployed where you have a, uh, a problem where you have a number, a small number of hot entries, and that effectively reduces this read rate here to um, uh, the read rate times two divided by the number of servers you have. Instead, 
Now you can write a P4 program. It'll run on top of the, uh, the switcher router again. And now you have all of those hot entries are st stored in the cache that's in the switch. So you see your hot entries get looked up in under a microsecond. Your throughput now becomes actual read rate. And you only need n log n uh, for the number of entries to be stored in, um, in the uh, uh, switcher router. And it eliminates the long tail latencies. So this is another real world use case. And there's a publication for this as well. The last one I'll show you, the last use case is telemetry. Um, here's another cartoon. So hopefully my cartoons are keeping you awake after lunch. So in this case, I have a, uh, a, a ECMP network. I have some traffic flowing through this network, and I want to be able to answer four questions. And with these four questions, we think that this will significantly reduce the mean time to um, uh, uh, repair. So the time it takes to troubleshoot and identify what's causing uh, problems in the network. So the first question we want to be able to answer is, okay, we've got traffic going through here. What path did that, did that uh, packet take when it went through the network? So that's the first question. The second question is, which rules were followed? Why did that traffic go through that path instead of one of these other paths? So now with programmability, you can actually program those forwarding rules into the, um, the uh, header information on a packet, and each packet becomes almost like a probe itself. The third question you want to answer is, okay, now we have this traffic going through there. How long did it take for it to queue at each one of these places? And the reason that's important is because as soon as you start to see increased latency, that tells you that there's some sort of micro event happening. Maybe it's a microburst, maybe you have a misbehaving uh, uh, VNF or an application you want to be able to identify quickly and separate, is this hardware or is this software? So here in this case, we see that the third switch has uh, the delay gone up from uh, nanoseconds into microseconds. So obviously there's a problem there. So the natural fourth question you want to be able to answer is, who did that packet share that queue with? If you knew who that packet shared the queue with, then you would know who's the aggressor flow, who's the victim flow, and then you can identify if it's a hardware or software problem. And that's exactly what we do. So here we have an aggressor flow flowing through here, and we're able to identify it and, and uh, use that to reduce the uh, time to uh, um, repair. So uh, we do this through a... Uh, uh, a spec we call INT, this is now um, in IETF, um, but basically it'll collect this information stored in the header of the packet through each step in the network. And then you can send it off to some sort of collector to be analyzed. So the benefits, as I mentioned, so you have lower uh, mean time to repair. Um, you can reduce it from maybe hundreds of seconds or, or, uh, or hundreds of minutes to seconds. Uh, you can identify those failures more quickly, and then you can use this information in a feedback loop to auto-remediate. So that's the next step, uh, intent-based networking, if you will. You get more accurate measurements. Now it's nanosecond granularity instead of uh, a millisecond. Now you have better visibility. You can see all the traffic, so it's not just using, uh, you know, instead of getting uh, tens of packets per second of telemetry information, which you would get in an S-Flow or an SNMP type of uh, monitoring, you get billions. Um, you also get the improved uh, performance and efficiency. And as I mentioned, you can use this to auto-provision, uh, load balance, or correct errors. So in summary, why is software transforming how networks are being built? Well, first of all, programmable switch chips are here to stay. Um, Tofino is one of the uh, first chips in the market that's programmable by P4, but we're seeing more and more products being developed. Uh, even the incumbent um, in the marketplace is now announcing chips that will be uh, programmable. <clears throat> Second one is peace of mind. Uh, software developers, of course, they want to write programs, and they'll always choose a programmable device if they can to overcome a fixed function device problem. Innovation, this is a key one. Now you have the ability to innovate in your forwarding plane. So functionality that you couldn't uh, introduce before, now you can introduce. And it's owned by the software developer, not by the chip architect. So any misinterpretation uh, of, of a spec or of a, uh, 
uh, MSA uh, that you had to write a software workaround for, that no longer happens. And then the last thing is uh, to accelerate. So we see that these applications, uh, by offloading and removing these middleware boxes, will accelerate networks. And then lastly, uh, future networks we feel will be vastly different than what they are today. Um, unique features will be easier to implement based on what your services that you want to provide to your customers or based on uh, limitations that you might have due to uh, uh, geography or other issues. Um, so now you won't be reliant upon a proprietary black box to, uh, w which is one size fits all. So that's all I had to present today. Hopefully this uh, was enlightening for you and if you have any questions, I'll be around. Please feel free to ask.